Welcome to Hubble's Universe Unfiltered. I'm Dr. Frank Summers of the Space Telescope Science Institute. Today, we're going to start by looking at some clouds. This is a gorgeous ground-based image of what we call the Magellanic Clouds. On the right, we have the Small Magellanic Cloud, and on the left, we have the Large Magellanic Cloud. These clouds are named after Magellan, who discovered them on his famous round-the-world voyage. However, it's kind of hard to say that he discovered them, simply because anybody who was already living in the Southern Hemisphere would be able to see these clouds with their naked eye. So, we really just sort of say they're named after Magellan. Now, if we take a closer look at the Large Magellanic Cloud, we can see that it's not a cloud of gas. Really, it's a cloud of stars. And this cloud is 170,000 light years away. That means, traveling at the speed of light, it would take 170,000 years just to go from where we are to this cloud. That Im immense distance places this cloud outside of our Milky Way galaxy. It is, actually, a satellite galaxy of the Milky Way. The large and small Magellanic clouds are dwarf galaxies that are orbiting around our Milky Way. Well, so, what we call the large cloud is really a dwarf galaxy. But just because it's a small galaxy doesn't mean it doesn't have big features. And the biggest is this nebula right here. It's called 30 Doradus, or as, uh, as a nebula, it's called the Tarantula Nebula. Now, if we zoom in on it, you can see that it is a gorgeous nebula. And if you sort of squint, you can see all these tendrils of gas st streaking out. That's why it got the name the Tarantula Nebula. It is, like many famous nebulae, a star-forming region, a place where stars are being born. It is a very large star-forming region, the largest in the Large Magellanic Cloud, and it's even larger than any star-forming region we've observed in our own Milky Way galaxy. Beyond that, it's larger than any star-forming region in the nearby Andromeda galaxy, or any of the three dozen or so nearby galaxies of our local group. This is the largest nearby star-forming region, so it's a very important object of study. If we go in a little bit closer, we can get the details in the heart of the nebula. This is another wonderful image from a ground-based telescope, the Anglo-Australian Telescope. Again, I haven't gotten to any Hubble images yet, but they're coming up in just a, just a bit. And you can see all of the incredible structure in the internals of this nebula. And it is not just a lot of star formation going on here, but star formation of very massive stars. Right here inside these two clusters, we have found lots of very high mass stars. And they are found only in these clusters. Why? Well, a couple reasons. First of all, stars form in clusters. In, in theory, I guess we could have stars form individually and isolated, but in practice that just doesn't happen. Whenever you get these star-forming regions, you're forming thousands of stars. You're not ever gonna, really going to form just one star. Two, massive stars only live short lives. A massive star can only live for 10, 20, 30 million years. They don't live very long. Now, I know tens of millions of years sounds long to you and I, but compared to stars like our sun, which will live for about 10 billion years, 10 million years is a very short time. And third, these clusters stay together for hundreds of millions of years. So a massive star that is born in a cluster is going to die inside that cluster. So you expect to find the massive stars only in these clusters. Knowing that, it would be really strange to find a massive star outside of a cluster. For example, in 2006, it appeared that this star right here a star called 30 Door 16, it was, discovered, it was examined in a survey, and it was found to have two strange things about it. One was that it had a spectrum that looked like a very massive star. Two, it was moving at a very large speed relative to the rest of this region. It was moving at about a quarter of a million miles per hour compared to the rest of 30 Doradas. That's kind of strange what would a very massive star be doing so far away from the clusters in which it was probably born? Well, claims like this need 
more verification. For example, this might not be a massive star. It might actually be a binary star. There might be two stars together that could account for its brightness, and the motion of those two stars around each other could account for the velocity. So we needed to follow up, and the follow up with Hubble was with some spectroscopic observations. Now, many of you remember that when you take white light and you pass it through a prism, it spreads it out into its component wavelengths, going from violet over here to red over here. The different wavelengths of light have different colors. And so this is what we call a spectrum of white light. If you take the spectrum of the sun, however, you don't get, just get that rainbow. You also get these black, dark lines across it. What's happening here is that the elements in the sun's atmosphere are absorbing some very specific wavelengths of light and causing dark lines across those regions. This is not a scientific observation. This is actually a drawing of the sun's spectrum. If we did a scientific observation, we'd actually take a much, much higher resolution spectrum, and there would be many more spectral lines. The size of the spectrum would be really, really, really long, so we have to chop it up into many pieces. So here is a scientific observation of the sun's light, and you can see that there are thousands upon thousands of spectral lines in the sun's spectrum. Now, this creates a beautiful, pretty picture. You get the nice colors throughout it. However, this is not terribly useful for science. The way astronomers tend to look at spectrum is as a graph. So here is the Hubble observation of 30 door 16 in the ultraviolet as a graph. Now what you can see is that this is intensity on this axis, and this is wavelength on this axis. What you can see is that there's some general average brightness across all of the spectrum, but those spectral lines, the places where it was dark, those would be the troughs in the spectrum, the places where this, line, this graph goes down, and there are actually some spectral lines that are in emission that are brighter than average, and they would be these peaks in the spectrum. So in looking at this spectrum, astronomers can analyze it to try and figure out what type of star it is. I'm not going to go into the details of how we do that, but what you really need to know is that the pattern of spectral lines is different for each type of star. So we take 30 door 16 and we compare it to a previous observation that Hubble made of a star known as HDE 269810. Again, most stars just have catalog numbers and these are the two catalog numbers of these stars. This star we know is a very massive star. And we compare the spectrum of this star to the spectrum of 30 door 16, you see the pattern matches. You get emission over here, you get a trough over here, you get a trough over here. You look at the pattern of the spectral lines in detail and they really match beautifully. This confirms that 30 door 16 really is a massive star and it's estimated to be 90 solar masses. That's 90 times the mass of our sun. Further, there were some observations from the VLT, a telescope known as the Very Large Telescope. I'm really, I'm not making that hat up. They call it the Very Large Telescope. There are some spectral observations from the VLT in visible light that show us that 30 door 16 is not a double star. So what we've got really looks like we've got a massive star that is uh, well away from the clusters. So, we went back into the Hubble archive to see if we had any other observations. We found an observation from the Wide Field Planetary Camera 2 taken in 1995 that shows 30 door 16 here at the center. And when you look at this and look at it in detail, you can sort of see that there might be some sort of bow shock along here. There might be a cavity emptied out by this star. Let me draw it in to sort of guide your eye, okay? So that uh, there might be, all right, I draw that in. Now if I take it out, can you sort of see that there's a, a curve around here that indicates there might be a cavity behind it, all right? This could be due to very fast motion. The star is moving through the gas around it, creating a bow shock and a cavity behind it. That would indicate that the star is moving very fast and might have been ejected from the cluster. That is the best explanation we have for all this data. That the star 30 door 16 over here 
was ejected from this cluster and is now streaming across space and will continue streaming across space. But you ask, how could that possibly happen? How can you get a massive star and just kick it out? Well, it's due to gravitational interactions amongst three stars. The idea is that you have a binary star. These two stars are orbiting around each other, minding their own business, doing very well, when along comes a third star. The third star comes in and gravitationally interacts with these two stars. In certain circumstances, that interloper star can now form a binary with one of the two stars, and the other star gets ejected. And matter of fact, the two stars form a very tight binary system, and the third star gets thrown out at very high velocity. These gravitational interactions between three stars are what can possibly create the circumstance where you've got a very massive star moving at a very high rate of speed, having been ejected from the cluster where it was born. There is, however, one caveat here. When we look at 30 door 16 and we measure its velocity, we're using Doppler effect. And Doppler effect only gives us the, the velocity along the line of sight, the radial velocity as it's called. So we know how much it's moving toward and away from us. We can't yet measure how much it's moving side to side in the plane of the sky. Because you know, even though it's moving at a really high velocity, it's 170,000 light years away. So it would take a very long time for it to move an appreciable amount, even with Hubble's high resolution. So we don't truly know that it's moving sideways with a huge velocity. However, if its sideways velocity were similar to its back and forth, for its motion toward or away from us, then it would be moving at a quarter of a million miles per hour, and it's located about 400 light years away from the cluster. Now, we know this cluster to be about one or two million years old. So a sanity check is, all right, could it actually have gotten to this distance in the time? Well, if you do the math, you find out that this star would have left this cluster about 1.4 million years ago. So the sanity check is there. OK, it makes reasonable sense that you could have had a gravitational interaction kick it out, and it could have gotten to this, this distance in the lifetime of the cluster and the lifetime of the star. So we all know that when bullies fight, it's the 90-pound weakling that gets kicked out, right? But in this case, we've, the 90-pound weakling is a 90 solar mass star. That would indicate that there are even more massive stars down in the core of this cluster. We're talking stars of 100 to 150 solar masses. Further evidence that there are really seriously massive stars inside these clusters. And there's even more evidence, because the astronomers who discovered this have also discovered two more stars in this region that appear to be high-velocity stars, massive stars, that could have gotten kicked out of these clusters. We don't have the full story yet, but it certainly looks like the stellar bullies inside these clusters may be repeat offenders in kicking stars out. Well, that's it for today. We'll see you next time on, on Hubble's Universe Unfiltered. Thank you.